I think a lot of people do make the same mistake as Kandinsky does. I mean, from the onset. Okay. And that has to do with the arguments that he's presenting, but just the idea that he's saying that I decided that I needed to write down all of these feelings and, and thoughts that I've had for the last years mm. and concretize them. And when you read through them from the very first page, or the, 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 well, that's the introduction, but from the first, first page of the actual book, he goes right into, without quoting them, speaking like Hegel and Kant in the, on the same page saying that you cannot repeat the Greeks because it's past. If you repeat it, it's a dead, uh, it has no inner life, right? Mm. And uh, I think well, that, that, that's the first and foremost thing to, to uh, notice about him, that it's these cliches that are so prevalent, are so prevalent that you actually think that you've thought them yourself, right? Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, uh, there's, Obviously, some influence from from Kant and also from Hegel, I guess. Uh, I think most prominently is also, I think, uh, Madame Blavatsky is her name. She was this um, esoteric, um, what do you call it, like um, esoteric spiritual branch of Christianity. Some call her a cultist or something. I know that Kandinsky was very interested in her ideas. So, um, I mean, a lot of these uh, things, this, uh, in a sense, tripart definition when he talks about like the, the pyramid of, of art, like the, the movement of how art history progresses. I guess you could read it in a sense uh, as a Hegelian. I'm not an expert on Hegel, so I won't, uh, uh, frankly, I don't understand Hegel, so I won't <laughs> <laughs> go too much into that. But, but also it has uh, some ideas from Blavatsky, which has this sort of um, idea about creation um, moving through geometric forms. So I think that he uses this. And this, I think, is more open about. I think he references her in the book and yeah, especially it, uh, in, yeah, yeah. Um, with this uh, art history progressing as a triangle moving forwards and upwards. And sense. then you have, uh, then again, there's a genius who drives it all and is uh, concerned with realizing the necessity to destroy things, to bring things down so that something can, can go. And it, mm. and it talks about a, what is the concept, a um, predetermined, I think it is, I've read it in, in Norwegian, but it's th this development is predetermined. And mm. that is the, the whole Geist idea of, of Hegel, that this is, which is blatantly and openly religious, Christian, in the sense that there is a master plan plan that history follows and unfolds the will of God or the will of the guys, the, the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then it manifests itself, of course, in, in the time in different ways and you have to then change your clothes as, you, as time develops, right? Mm. And I think that's, um, so it's, it's, I mean, this is something I guess we've talked about before. I guess Kandinsky is the more, well, it's on the spiritual and art, his book, right? So he, is sort of the spiritual, the more Kantian side to it in some way. And then later, and especially today, it's, it definitely flips over to Hegel, which is more like practical activism. How do you actually do politics with art? Mm, yeah. um, but but uh, obviously Kandinsky is based on this type of mysticism, like when he talks about the, the power of color. Yeah. And that's interesting because I, I can read that and I can say, okay, well, of course, colors have, can create a certain mood. But what he does is to, and this is the typical art way of thinking, um, it's the same thing as, for example, when, um, it's, uh, no, it was uh, Malevitz, the Russian yeah. colleague, mm -hmm. modernist, who basically said that the essence of Rembrandt is this darkness, is black, and so he painted the black square, which is the essence of Rembrandt. Mm. And I think that kind of mysticism, where you just define the essence of something, and then you take away the external form and bring the soul of it all in its pure form, that's the idea. And then it's, it's supposed to have the same effect. And of course, to me as a, as a kitsch painter, as a classical painter, it's completely absurd to, to, because we recognize things 
through the bodily presence. That's how you can identify with, with what is happening in the picture or identify with what's happening on the street. Mm. And then take away that and then that the color should just be pure removed from what it should depict and it should still then keep its sort of energy or whatever it is. Yeah. So I think this is uh, uh, like you say what it talks about when it talks about the spiritual aspect of thing like um, uh, that the constituent parts of the painting in a sense uh, act on their own behalf. So I just they have uh, their own inner force. Yeah, they have, yeah. So they have some force, uh, and in a sense, um, it becomes animated. In a, it's a sort of animism, art animism, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, or at least that's how I conceptualize it. That that every form and color has different like. Um, like he says, um, on face value, they have uh, physical properties, uh, like when you sense an object. But for instance, when you perceive an object, there's there's an additional layer uh, of of uh, abstraction in a sense. But that can also create a sort of feeling. So I think for Kandinsky, he's he's really about this um, inner nature of I guess what is, um, in a sense, the outer form. Um, so I read about uh, in his autobiography. He he talks about this because he was practicing law for for a long time. I didn't. I don't think he started painting until he was like thirty years old, old or something. So we had this uh, project where he was going to uh, write a thesis about how they practiced law in, you know, in Moscow in the in the big cities, uh, uh, in contrast to how they practiced law in in the more provincial places, you know. Uh, and he said that when, when he went out uh, to the countryside, he was uh, really struck by seeing all these houses, churches that were completely like plastered and embedded with ornaments and colors, uh, bright colors. And he, he felt like when he uh, went into a house there to speak to, to the people who lived there, uh, he said it was like um, entering a painting. So he had this idea about uh, the painting being a sort of uh, cosmos in itself. If you are able to emancipate the different parameters and elements of art and then recreate a sort of harmony between all these forces and principles, you will create an art that is abstract at the same time free, but still able to invoke this sense of pure intensity of feeling. And from here, I think it's also relevant that um, for me, Kandinsky has always uh, resonated very well with the concept of synesthesia, this uh, thing that I think most people have. We talked a bit about this in like this uh, neurological thing where um, um, this, that's a long digression, but uh, this ornithologist that um, investigates how the, the bird's brain works, like if you, they recognize it, um, their mother with just this little tiny red dot on the beak. Yeah. So that is the essence in a sense. That's the pure intensity that stimulates this response. So when the ornithologist like uh, made a stick with these uh, different dots and stuff, he could in essence create a stimulus response that was stronger than their own mother. Um, I think this, this sort of uh, mental cross-wiring in a sense, this synesthesia, for instance, people can uh, hear colors. I think that was the case with Kandinsky, like when he painted, he could hear sounds and associate different things with sound. And also um, when you hear music, for instance, some people can see colors and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I think he was um, uh, investigating what are the specifics of the different art practices and mediums, but also what is this kind of phenomenon that combines is there what is this perceptual aspect of our reality where music visual um, sound and image in a sense bleeds together and he wanted to um, he realized that he wanted to create the same force that music has because music in a sense it's form and content in one thing Maybe he thought that uh, at least his paintings were, in a sense, inferior to what he heard when he heard uh, uh, Wagner's Lohengrin, for instance. Uh, that was a really remarkable experience for him. Uh, and he wanted to 
emancipate the painting mm. in a way that painting in a sense can act with the same uh, bravado and intensity as music. I think. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, from that English version of, of uh, Kandinsky's uh, book that, that I've forwarded to you. In the mm. foreword there, uh, this author is writing about how the foremost property of music, its most precious property, is that it's, it doesn't have to imitate. Mm. And that's the whole idea. And th that's that's um, why I think it is important to read this book also as a classical painter, so that you recognize the arguments and the whole idea of, of what modernism is. Mm. Because it, it rests on this thing that the outer form stands in the way of, of the inner content, uh, which is to me, uh, of course, quite absurd. Again, mm. you, you can recognize the inner content because you see the outer form. You can see on a person who is uh, depressed or happy or through their body language what their inner emotional state is. And there's a, you know, his, his kind of, uh, the whole way it's written also is quite uh, Kantian with these uh, long passages that are like neutrally descriptive but where you start in the end wondering what the hell he started with and then you have to think what what, what is he getting at there but then he's suddenly extremely clear and and this is when he's saying that like he has uh, two tongues here he talks about how there's a progression and that the outer form the the well, figurative form in the painting then hinders the, the the message but at the same time he's saying that it's just a descriptive uh, um, uh, well, description mm. that all forms should be open if you are an artist and everyone everything is equally necessary because his main idea is this thing about inner necessity if it's done out of inner necessity but that's also where he then comes in with with an idea which is totally non-classical which is that anything can be harmonious if it expresses the intention of the one who's making it mm. which is quite absurd because it's uh, from, again from the classical point of view because you and also that connected with what he's saying when he's talking about this development as this long liberation it's a fight for liberation and so then again it's, it's not a question of uh, well, it's a question of understanding how he argues and seeing that from the classical point of view it's absurd because the whole point is that the basic human nature never changes. So to talk about, uh, and also the way you tell a story never changes. So this is getting back to Jung again. Mm. The, the originality in, in storytelling is absurd. It's a diff you might have a different angle. Mm. This is the closest idea that Aristotle comes to, to uh, originality. But to see it as a liberation from something means that what is done before weighs you down. Mm. And, and again, if you th think mythical, if you think archetypal, that way of thinking is completely absurd because you don't want originality because if you have originality, you cannot recognize it. Because the whole human perception is based on recognizing what is known, but it's just from a slightly different angle, perhaps. That's the closest thing you could get yeah, to originality within the classical mindset. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's interesting because he talks about this concept of inner necessity that I guess is the kernel, in a sense, of his philosophy. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and just by, by the way, that, that's, uh, sorry, uh, that's one thing that I have a problem with when it, when it comes to the modernistic way of thinking or to be very diplomatic, it's a difference in the modernistic way of thinking and the classical way of thinking. Then in the classical, if you go through literature and read what is said about that, you have specific, clear concepts, mm. technical concepts on composition, on painterliness, and all, all these things. Whereas what Kandinsky is working with are really vague ideas, like, for example, in the necessity, what what is what the hell is in a necessity and i think that's uh, yeah that's a problem i have i can't go into that because well then i'm giving up all my integrity to whatever the this uh, kantian judge okay. decides is okay yeah. right 
So sorry about I that. Can under, uh, yeah. I can understand that. So uh, I think um, reading about inner necessity, he, he divides it into three constituent parts about like this, this first element is obviously um, personality in a sense, temperament. And also uh, the other is um, environment. But reflecting the time. Yeah. yeah, and both yeah. those two are are, and time are, in, nation, the, are in the in the hands of the zeitgeist, yeah. so to speak. Uh, but the third, there he he becomes, I mean, perhaps a bit more diplomatic, or or like from a Jungian sense, he says that there must be some universal um, constituent part um, of what you're doing. So uh, he he talks about this example of uh, Indian totem sculpture, for instance. Yeah. Uh, this has like uh, the same validity. It, it it is inhabited by the same soul, but the soul is expressed in different manners um, in relation to time and place. But so there's this uh, subjective element, but also. In a, in a sense, expressing a universal nature. So you have this kind of um, moment where, where he, he even says, uh, departing a bit from the content philosophy, that art for art's sake uh, is completely uninteresting to him. That, that is also completely dead art. So it's not like abstraction in itself is um, an end goal uh, that is necessarily better than other art. So I mean, he developed this um, group uh, Der Blaue Reiter with uh, a lot of other uh, German expression artists like uh, Franz Mark, August Mack uh, and those people. And they made this uh, catalog where they in included like prints of ancient sculptures, modern art, everything which they thought to express some sort of interesting grasp, both on formal um, elements but also this thing that, for instance, we could um, perceive like uh, hieroglyphic uh, Egyptian art, not necessarily with the same two first like personality and this zeitgeist uh, thing, but we could still, um, in a sense, grasp this universal nature of, uh, of the forms and, and the intensity of the colors and, and these different parts in the same way we could dig up a vase from 10,000 years ago and still have some aesthetic, mythic or spiritual connection with this, even though we don't have a concept of who made it or if it was perhaps a religious object infused with different elements that are now uh, hidden from us uh, from all time. So, so there is this aspect where he kind of always want to circle back to a sort of universal mythos, but He's still obviously, in, uh, and especially in his time, a sort of revolutionary in way of method and, and that he wants to emancipate painting to then include what he perceives as like the, the inner nature of the outer, in a sense. So you could say that he perhaps uh, he, he flips the table, in a sense, and wants to investigate like the, these uh, hidden parts and bring them forth on the canvas and then start to work directly with these forces in a sort of harmonious way. And then he, of course, he has all these uh, spiritual ideas that, uh, that I think also shared with uh, Franz Marc, for instance, but uh, I think they may have gotten this from Blavatsky, I'm not exactly sure, but that they codify the paintings with like, um, blue has a different kind of spiritual quality than, for instance, um, yellow. Uh, in, in, a, in a physical sense, you know, he says that yellow is um, it's going, it's expansive in a sense, while, while blue is um, convergent, I think, like it, it's recessive. Yeah. Like, yeah. So they, they have like different physical properties, but then in the abstracted layer of perception, they also have this psychological function that uh, yellow has this sort of warm spirituality, but if you have too much of it, it would seem like frenetic or almost like madness in a sense, if not treated in relation to form. So there's this difference between the pure, the pure like elements like color and form also need some sort of harmonious interplay. They need to be tamed in a sense. And there I think 
uh, at least Kandinsky perhaps thinks of himself as a, a painter that tries to get to know these fundamental forces and then methods to tame them in a sense. But of course, uh, whether blue really has this um, eternal spiritual quality or not, I'm not sure. Um, this is obviously not science, you know, but uh, a way he codifies and creates additional layers of meaning in his paintings. But I noticed when he talks about this example about the totems, mm -hmm. and he says that they have the same validity as a modern living work, he says. And I was just thinking about this because it's, again, it's based on, on the mysticism of the, the, the spirit of the color. Mm. And it reminds me of something that, that uh, Arthur Danto writes about in, uh, in um, After the End of Art, mm. where he talks about the Museum of Monochrome Paintings. And all the paintings in that museum, a hypothetical example, are identical. You cannot separate them, yeah. but they're made for different reasons. And so they are individual works. Mm. And that's when I'm thinking, th this is really giving up your total uh, integrity and power to the judge who shall, shall judge if you, what you do is good or not. Yeah. When you're basing yourself l completely on the actual validity of the color itself. But of course, again, I can read it and say, see that, okay, you can use colors, obviously, to create warmness, you can create a cool atmosphere and, and all of these things. Mm. Um, but detached from the, the realistic form, it becomes uh, mysticism. Yeah. And, yeah. and he is very clear about how the representational form is something that you have to avoid because it reduces the intensity of, or the spirituality uh, of the color. And I think at that point, it's, it's the, my position and Kandinsky's position is so far apart that we're basically just talking about, okay, you can come in as a sociologist and describe what Kandinsky is doing and you can understand what you yourself are doing and then again understand the difference between between the two. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it sort of nicely ties up also to the conversation we had about um, uh, Gasset, mm. the dehumanization of art, because it's m making the same point, I guess, because, and, and that's a where he's so a bit tricky. He doesn't, in s the same way that he says that the outer form is, is, has lower value, you mustn't use it, he says, oh, but you should be free to do anything if you want, if it's the inner necessity tells you to. Um, but at the same time, if you try to revitalize the Greeks, then you're on a lower level because it just has dead content, um, because the, the form is dead. And that is pure Hegelianism. That is exactly what Hegel is talking about, how that, at that level, uh, at that lower level, the body was sufficient to express the Geist, the spirit. But then it develops, the guys become so much more intelligent that the form is not uh, sufficient to express it anymore. And he also says, and this is, so, so there's so, I mean, he's so close to saying that if you do those things, you're making kitsch. Hmm. He's that close to saying it. Because it's the exact same point that you find in these typical um, kitsch critics, revitalizing something that is past, that is passé, you cannot do anymore, that is kitsch. I mean, this is uh, Thomas Kulkes is writing about it. If you paint in the academic way today, after the academic form has been superseded, as he says, mm. then it's kitsch. Yeah. And then you get back to, and uh, this ties up to Kandinsky, but, but coming from Kulka, uh, he also talks about Picasso, which we, could, we should get to because uh, Kandinsky talks about him. Uh, Picasso's Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, the, the bathers, mm. uh, which is uh, um, uh, cubistic. That was for a long time looked down upon all, uh, also by his colleagues. But then, and it would have been a bad work if it didn't have a art historical uh, uh, consequence. Mm. And that's what I'm thinking, wait, wait, what? What about the actual painting? Is the quality of it completely uninteresting? Is it, uh, are we not looking at, are we not living in reality where that actual object has quality? And again, that's uh, my uh, failure to see his lived experience here when it comes to color. <laughs> color. <laughs> so.
that's, that's uh, yeah, okay. But uh, I was um, interested in, um, because uh, I'm obviously no expert on, on kitsch, but I was thinking a bit about this um, idea in kitsch of um, rendering first and foremost uh, a story and then with the potential of invoking a sense of empathy or connection bet yeah. between the, the observer and the observed, so to speak, like channeling something. Kandinsky in his part as well is, is advocating for some sort of um, ideally that, that the work and, and the observer should be able to uh, fuse together um, in a sense might not be uh, perhaps in in a in a literal sense but in a in, in a sense of intensity so i was just thinking uh, a bit about this uh, with with like a kitsch painting is something different than a completely like uh, photographic rendering of something uh, as far as i understand um so so in that case like as a thought experiment you, you could say that also kitsch has this sense of um, not necessarily being completely true to the outer form, but being true to a sense of necessity to express what is, um, what do you say it in English? Like um, your goal, in a sense. Mm. You, you have to, you can, you can have some slabs of paint here and there, you can have scratch marks, you can have like uh, traces, it doesn't need to be like a photographic identical rendering. It is in a sense as poetry and drama in a way. Yeah. Um, and there of course you have this, not necessarily originality, but you solve a certain problem by, the, by your craft in a sense by way of, of, of a certain um, resonance, uh, what is needed to achieve this yeah, effect. Yeah. In but then there's a question of, you can also, you can also say that, uh, I mean, to use a stupid example, cannibals have, a, have an idea of what, how they shall achieve a goal. So, okay, then they're doing kitsch painting because we also have an idea of how to achieve a goal. Right? So, I mean, this is stupid, but I mean, um, the major difference here, and he says it, I, I almost uh, uh, chuckled uh, when I read that, when he talks about avoiding, how is it, the, I think he says narrative, and he mentioned that it mustn't become like fairy tale like mm. and, and uh, I don't know, if, I don't remember if he says theater, but, but he's in that landscape. Yeah, yeah. And so what he's saying there, and this is a major uh, point, when you talk about the difference between kitsch mm -hmm. and art, it's not a question of figurative versus abstract. No. It's a question of the mentality or sentimentality of it, if there's a story being told there. And that's the aspect that he doesn't want to be there. So uh, in that sense, he's exactly mirroring Kant, who says that the, the sentimentality is the barbaric uh, element, it should be totally removed. So, I can, if you take away when you're saying you cannot uh, recapitulate the Greeks, you should not tell stories, it should not be too realistic because that destroys the spiritual value of it, and it just says what it says about, uh, read what it says about color or uh, having a specific goal to it, it's so vague that yeah, of course, I have goals. Yes, I use color. Mm. But the difference here is that um, I at least, of course, you have different approaches within classical painting too, but I at least come from a point where I start out by not trying to have color on canvas. Mm. That it's so muted, and Odnardim has talked about the gray being the mother of all colors, that you, so this is getting technical for a little second. So on your palette, if you have gray as the center and it goes towards red or towards blue or, or yellow, or whatever it is, but the, what unifies it is that, that gray color. So you get that harmony that harmonizes everything. So you get one total unity in the painting so that when you focus on something that is more clearly uh, depicted mm -hmm. and then you have other things that are not so clearly depicted, you get a much more stronger theatrical dramatic effect out of those areas and mm. then towards the end you can start increasing the the the, um, 
uh, what's it called, uh, the intensity of the color mm. to really get an effect. Mm. And, you know, Leonardo talks about that, how when you paint someone with a blue cape, it should be a blue cape and not a form, a blue, a form with blue color. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a major difference between uh, kitsch painting and modernist painting yeah. as, as he is mm. uh, laying it out there. Mm. Yeah, because uh, the reason I was just thinking about it is it's like this difference between rendering something like uh, with a hundred percent accuracy to, yeah. um, and then on the other side you have this idea of painterliness in a sense, you know, yeah, yeah. like you, yeah. you describe. So there's something there, but 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 obviously Kandinsky is is at least for his own sake not interested in depicting stories in that way, and I I think that's why he always circles back to music in a sense that music doesn't tell you stories in a sense literally but they still invoke a sense of emotional intensity and I think he wants to um, be able from a painterly perspective to work uh, with the same kind of intensity as music even though it might be impossible because the mediums are like like he also talks about like Music has um, duration mm. as an essential part, but the painting you could like get in a sense in instantly. Well, the they present themselves differently in time and are subject to yeah. different rules, but they, the rules are still uh, being observed by the same faculties in a sense. I guess that could be construed as a bit Kantian as well. So well, most definitely. I mean, it's it's. Uh and it's so funny because how is it? I should read it again. Kant talks about well, music is higher up because it's not visual; it's not a re representation of reality. But then, uh, writing poetry is even higher up, and he doesn't explain it like that. But that's uh, my uh, interpretation of what he's saying is that that when you have well, when you have letters on a page, those are abstract symbols. If you, it says apple, it is not a rendering of an apple, but the image comes up in your head. Yeah. And I mix up if that was in the foreword or if it's Kandinsky talking about it. He that talks about it, the sound of the tree as like this idea. And yeah, and that's that thing. That's uh, this Kantian free play of the faculties or free play of the imagination, mm -hmm. which then is considered to be a pure form. So, because that's the irony, that, that is a type of imitation or type of, of mimesis. Mm. But it's not do, done through the, the dirty, uh, our dirty senses. It's purely intellectual. Yeah. And then it's, then it's okay. So, so that's why Kant then prefers or, or, or values poetry, because it's just, it is not an actual apple. It's not a well-painted apple. You see that you just get the idea of apple in your head. Yeah, but see, that's what I think is a bit interesting. So I, I guess, uh, uh, I mean, we could call Kandinsky a, a bit of a snob, you know, but I think he still works with this sort of universality and mimesis in a sense, like he works with some forms and, and aspects of reality that, uh, as far as I can understand, is very, very real to him and that he wants to express. Uh, and another interesting thing is that uh, when I read... I understand that, that this is lived experience. <laughs> yeah, lived experience. You understand that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, but the interesting part is when he, when he uh, was working on his... Uh, like, uh, because he had these um, different uh, uh, suits of work. Uh, he had the, the um, impressions and then yeah. the improvisations. And compositions. And he, he had the compositions. Um, uh, the impressions were like, uh, yeah, as, as the, the word describes, in a sense, improvisation was a bit like, uh, you know, subconscious uh, meandering around on the canvas, trying out different things. And compositions were a bit like um, a more formal, uh, larger exercise of these kinds of um, both uh, a sense of subject matter, but still this kind of um, unconscious, just letting the the the, the parameters, the, the forces, the forms and the colors emerge in a sense uh, and being in a sense this vessel uh, for them. But when he worked on, uh, on the compositions especially, I think composition 5, 6 and 7 perhaps, 
uh, he is really, really into like um, uh, Christian thought. He was a devout Orthodox Christian, as far as I know. And he was uh, obsessed with the, the, the myth and the idea of the flood, the apocalypse and all these biblical themes. So, I mean, it's not necessarily literally depicted by way of human representation, but there's still this sort of, um, like the forms being this sort of cosmic clash of different forces enveloping each other and washing over each other. And he was constantly um, working with this. But, but there came to a point where um, I think his then girlfriend, another uh, painter, uh, Gabriel Münter, uh, told him that he over-intellectualized the idea of like the goal for one of his compositions. So she told him that he should focus more on just like uh, the, the um, associations, like, the, like using flood as a mantra in itself. And he had been working on this painting for six months. And then after he went into that state of mind, he managed to paint it in like three days or something. And I mean, you can say a lot about that from a technical perspective and a philosoph uh, philosophical perspective. But what I think is interesting in that, even though he seems to be so uh, obsessed with this like purity of form and color, he still had this deeply religious and mythological themes embedded in his work, even though he didn't depict them in a literal sense. So I think that kind of, um, I don't know if you could call it a paradox or, or like a conflict, uh, echoes in a sense this um, distinction between like the personality and this cultural zeitgeist, but also this universal aspect of thing that all good art should embody, even if it's figurative or if it's like uh, a sculptural work that depicts certain things. So he chooses this as his method and he might be a bit elitist about that, at least like for the time being that he, he obviously thinks that this is like the way to go forward for at least for him, but also I guess for, for the, I think he, sees himself in the top of this triangle it wouldn't be <laughs> well, that, <that's laughs> too daring to assume. <laughs> so, so, I mean. Well, that, that, that's fine. I mean, yeah. obviously also when I, when I read this, uh, I definitely see myself as uh, a couple of light years above what he's doing. So that's given. That's why yeah. I do what I do, yeah. right? And you do what you, you yeah. do, and that's, that's fine. Mm. Um, but the, so from where I stand, <clears throat> when you talk about oh, when when you refer to him talking about the, the the spiritual quality of the the color or the intention of the artist again that's the Kantian idea of the intention right and not the actual practice um, then the, this is what I'm trying to teach people not to do when I do when I teach teach my courses mm. because a major f uh, flaw in people trying to paint figurative is that they still have this, these so-called modern ideas that if I have envisioned something painting it, then the, the painting has that quality. Mm. So it's a type of sort of mysticism. You, you start trying to sap the painting with that intention mm. and then the painting itself doesn't have it at all. Mm. I mean, I, I, I've met somebody, someone who was sort of half figurative, half abstract painting from some from, from photo and having painted this or that, and that had value because it was that day and all of those things. And none of that was in the actual object itself. Mm. So, and once you start deconstructing that, the spiritual value from actually living in reality, um, because my vantage point is, of course there are spiritual values, but you see them much more in an expression like this, or in what we have on the wall behind us here, the hope by Watts. Mm. Um, so, and this is why I wanted to mention this thing where he talks about uh, Cezanne's debating women. Um, and I'll try to translate it because it says that that it's triangularly composed. And the point is relating to what I'm teaching these these students that I have that are mm. amateurs, and that this uh, uh, you know this uh, geometric form is an old principle which was uh, le left behind 
when it had no more had no more of this inner meaning or soul, and that uh, Cezanne then revitalizes it, but sort of makes it a point in itself, so that you see the triangle more than you see the women mm. there, and then it becomes an, an abstraction, of course, of these women. They become come a shape instead of. So people performing an action. Mm. This is exactly what uh, why, why Gasset talks about the dehumanization as a neutral term. It's yeah, no longer those women, but they become they become dehumanized, neutrally speaking, in the sense that they become a shape instead of living human beings. And again, you can say, well, yes, of course, I think about well when I do these master classes, I talk about the the diagonals and how the lines connect together, and this rhythm comes through into another figure, mm. and so obviously that has to be in place, but if there's only that, then it no longer relates to the human experience from the classical point of view. Yeah. Uh, because you can, you can say, and I've said, that it's like behind every composition, you, you take Titian or you take Rembrandt or you take uh, Caravaggio, it's like it has some Chinese sign behind it, sort of the, the, the structure of it, the armature of it, right? But that doesn't mean that if you paint those lines in the pure form, it has the same intensity as the 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 uh, martyrdom of Matthew by Caravaggio, yeah. because the, the intensity comes through recognizing that someone is actually being killed. You can you can recognize how it feels, or you can you can imagine how it feels, and you see the anger of the mur murderer coming, and it's just about to uh, deliver the final blow. Right? Yeah. So so it's um, I think that's that's the weakness. I mean, there are basically everything he says is a weakness from the classical point of view, right? But but if you try to just look at it neutrally speaking, that those figures as a triangle mm. become too obvious. They then become an abstract shape, and that becomes a problem. In the sense, in the same way that when I start painting, I try not to uh, work with red and green and blue and yellow. I tr have it more muted so that I get the atmosphere first, and then the color can mm. come and help and make it more. Vital, yeah. vital, right? Mm. So the point of departure then is is actually really clear. Uh, oh yeah, surprisingly, yeah. Mm. yeah. That he he wants to make this uh, what for you is an armature in a sense, this uh, underdrawing or or this um, uh, these formal elements. He wants them to work uh, autonomously. Autonom yeah, we said the same word at the yeah. same time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. 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 That's it, interesting. Yeah, yeah it's uh, and this is what I've been thinking. This is, of course, slightly polemic, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> so, so this is my take. Uh, now we sort of started going more freestyle on the basis of what we've been talking about. Mm. When you look at, for example, abstract painting or the or impressionism, which is, of course, there's wonderful works, but it's still getting unmistakably modern in the sense, I mean, for example, I think it was, uh, it was Monet? Haystack? Yeah, Haystack but I'm thinking about something else. Okay. He painted his wife on her deathbed, I think, I think when she was dead. And he was sort of shocked by that, that he started to, to look at these different tones and, and, and depict it, right? Mm. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a um, uh, not that it shouldn't be sad in that situation, but it's kind of this sort of moralistic idea about uh, not exploiting that situation and to make something that is sentimental, right? And you don't, you basically, well, I might be wrong, maybe there's one counterexample, but the, I don't think you find one mother and child motif in the Impressionists, right? Yeah. Because it's all about, th so the point is, Impressionism, for example, is, uh, like other has been talking about, is based on Velasquez, but it's a tiny part of Velasquez. It's just so, so, so-called painterliness, mm. but only that, so to speak. Abstract painting, you could say, is getting out of this whole idea in the 19th century, you started to get to accept the sketch, and it became more and more sort of valuable as a thing, as a discipline in itself, and that sort of morphs into abstract painting because it's done its, its pure painterliness, right? Mm. Um, so you can, or you can, you can do glazing, of course, or you can paint really thick. But if you only glaze, you get Rothko. If you only paint thick, you get um, I don't know whomever. So it's like you take one little detail from the old masters, remove it from its function, and only do it, and then you get 
art. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but, but that's basically what he's saying. Yeah, and I so it's, it's, I don't think he would disagree. No, I think that well, would be in line with this concept of emancipating the different uh, parameters and then right. giving them a sort of new legitimacy and new reality and investigating that sort of intensity, how it works both on a, like a physical and then psychological and then spiritual. I mean, this again, this uh, tripart thing. But hmm. it was just one thing when you talked about Monet because he, he describes uh, in his, I guess, what was his journey to abstraction, uh, seeing this haystack by that Monet painted in 1895 or something like that. But did, does he talk about that? I, I think he, he talks about this. Uh, if oh. it's not in this, it's, a, it's in another of his books or perhaps his autobiography, where he, he um, uh, recollects that he is standing in a museum and is watching just this uh, play of colors, orange and purples, and he was like really captivated by the colors. But then he suddenly realized like where is, where is the representation in a sense? And in, he, he talks about how he becomes like almost uh, disgusted in not being able to recognize so he obviously has this mm. impulse, you know, um, of so, being... But, but, but being at what stage was this? Was it like I, before he started I, painting? I think or? this was uh, before he painted his first abstract studies and stuff. So yeah. I think this was like one of the, uh, I guess you could call it breaking points in the mm. sense that he's at once transfixed by the formal, uh, like these intensities in themselves, but then also confused in not being able to delegate this to form an object or like a, a concept or, or, or a story or something like that. But this was something that stuck with him. And then, of course, we have the story of uh, him coming home. I don't know, like uh, it, was, um, it was dark in the studio and this painting is lying on the side. And he's like, what, what painting is this? I've never seen something like this. Uh, and he thought this was really weird and had this sort of same sort of epiphany that he had previously with Monet. And then he comes back in the studio the day afterwards and it's uh, full daylight and then of course it's my improvisation number whatever lying there or some, some, mm. something else. But then he could readily um, understand like the different uh, objects and the representational parts. And then for him it didn't have the same like transfixing pure fusion, this force of fusion, this complete like you embody the painting and the body and uh, the painting embodies you. So this, this is where he becomes this sort of phenomenological painter that he wants to really be inside these four. He wants the, 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 the painter and the painting to be one force and, and like the observer and the observed to be one uh, vibration in a sense. So you have all these small vibrations that create vibrations uh, in your mind and then these forces are simultaneously vibrating or resonating together. So I think like for him seeing Monet where the haystack is almost engulfed just by like this, uh, not necessarily pointillism, but, but you know, patch, patchworks of color and where the form is not readily like delineated or something. And then this painting lying on the floor. And then I think he just had this idea that he should investigate what he was transfixed by in a sense. And then writing this book, I mean, I think he wrote this book from the year when he uh, allegedly made this first abstract painting, like in 1910. And I think it was published in 1911 or 1912 or something like that. So it was still, this is like really early in his formal experiments, if you could call it that. And of course he went a bit back and forth. Then he went to, um, he was in Russia, Germany, Paris, Bauhaus. We also met Paul Klee, which is another interesting figure that I guess we could talk about uh, uh, in another conversation. Also from a phenomenological point and, and, and like this cataloging uh, different movements, how lines, like you talked about, like this line goes here. And in a sense, it might not tell a story in a literal sense, but it still depicts or creates this um, impression of forces, a sense of like the, the gravity has its, uh, not, the painting has its own gravity in a sense, like this form goes around this line and that suddenly creates a sense of volume. And then your brain kind of synthesizes all these movements and points into a different 
uh, sort of composition that that the the part is larger uh, the whole is larger than the parts uh, and it emerges as one thing that you again like a uh, described kind of um, at least that was the idea that's when he talks about this purity of color of form is this uh, point of entry into like a um, phenomenological embodiment with and within the work and I think um, when he talks about this Indian uh, totem sculpture and stuff like that and he says that it has the same soul but they are just expressed by you now the different uh, previous two categories of, of like zeitgeist and, and, and personality temperament and every person has their own kinds of needs to express um, in the way that is most, I mean, purposeful for them, that art for art's sake in itself is uh, as dead a concept as, for instance, uh, you know, just uh, these dead forms from a Hegelian po point of perspective that you talked about. So I think this, this point is a bit interesting for me because I thought there was more complexity there than I first uh, imagined. So, uh, so yeah, from, from like a, a kitsch perspective as well, I think this idea about um, the distinction between like painterliness and then being able to tell a story and then uh, at the same time embodying a sort of universal, um, eternal point of view is, uh, is interesting. Even though Kandinsky personally was obviously interested in, in like pure abstraction, as pure as he could get and tried to justify that by no no, um, no um, theatrical effects and no, nothing like that it, it's strange I, I, sorry, yeah. sorry but uh, that's funny because he also uh, you know made a lot of scenography for theaters with his uh, so that's another thing again yeah yeah but but okay it's always theatrical because it's on stage but it's you know it's that's one of the most used uh, criticisms of Art Nerdum in the 70s was that it was theatrical. Okay, yeah. So it's, uh, that's not what you're supposed to do, but it's, it's strange, you know, I've, I've read a couple of books on, on screenwriting because the wonderful thing there is that it's so untainted by art ideas mm. because they're only focused on what makes the story tick, what makes it work. Mm. what you have to have in there and what must not be in there. Mm. And one of the most fundamental things is that it must not be important only to you. Mm. It's like the exact opposite of what Kandinsky is talking about. Mm. It mustn't be just your, well, your inner necessity. It has to relate to the others, mm. to, to general humanity. And it has to be as timeless as, as possible. But of course, with screenwriting, we are obviously talking about a figurative form, <laughs> form right? It's not that you don't make abstract movies. Yeah. So it's, it's um, I think it's a question of, uh, we talked about it before, that, I mean, you're concerned with Jung and archetypes, mm. and I am as well, but our ways of getting there differ quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I th think it's, it's so you can read it like that and just understand. And I think that is really important for, because I, I don't think it's a big problem, but I've definitely met figurative painters who are sort of scared to, to be close to modernism and so in case they should get uh, infected. Painted, <laughs> yeah. or anyways. Uh, but I'm thinking, well, if you, if you think like that, then you are really don't have much integrity and much. Uh, awareness of where you, where you stand, right? Mm. So it's, um, uh, yeah, in, in that sense, it's, it's good to read, to know how, uh, again, these things that, are, that he's arguing, you can see some of these things just taken out of context. Yes, I use color. Yes, I think of composition. But then there are the things that go in the t different direction where it says that the way to get to that highest eternal value is not through representation. So it's not much, it's not more difficult than to say that, uh, this is something that struck me, I had this conversation with Cheng Wu that was wonderful about Taoism and, and painting. Um, and going into that and studying it, uh, Chinese painting, high point in the 10th century, 
It's quite strange when Europe is down there, China is down there. And when Europe starts going up in terms of painting, China goes down from a classical point of view. Mm. Because what, and what happens then is that they go into something that is where the colors and the strokes become important. Mm. And then also big signatures and they start to write on this on this painting. So what we're, what, what we're seeing, if you just see it from really from above, you have that that uh, contention between kitsch and art, and, and kitsch and art are basically just new terms on this old age-old dichotomy. Yeah, pendulum. That that you see. I mean, you go go back to to Greece in the ninth century, and look at the sculptures there. Well, that's modernism, mm. and then they grow out of it and become something wonderful, and then it goes down again. Mm. So it's. Uh, you can see, yeah, the, the similarity is some kind of idea of, of eternity, but it's a huge disagreement in what, how you get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's interesting. If you were to like um, think about uh, art history as a person in a Jungian sense, for instance, that, that you have these different like dips into, for instance, uh, full consciousness, full representation, of yourself or your world around you and then dipping back into unconsciousness or even in your shadow for instance all these repressed things and um, and uh, like this um, Indian neurologist Vilanur Ramachandran he, he talks about like uh, just uh, art history in India for instance has gone through all these different cyclical movements and then like from representation from to abstract to, yeah, uh, yeah from uh, yeah, because it's not just a european thing no no it seems to be universal yeah. in the sense that as well mm. so and and then perhaps it has something to do with like um uh, i mean temperament uh, as perhaps kandinsky would say when he talks about uh, um and personality in this first kind of moment of this uh, inner necessity that uh, some people are more inclined f to representation as a means to access this kind of mythological universal landscape, while other people are like Kandinsky, for instance, needs to find, discover this spiritual, what for him is the inner, in a sense, truth of, of reality from different means. And that on art history as a whole, you have these kind of different temperaments always being in dialogue and, and yeah, exchanging place in a sense, or, or working in a cyclical manner. So, so that's why um, I'm, not, I'm not agreeing that you, you couldn't, for instance, pick up Greek painting styles. But, but at the same time, I realized it, it, it couldn't be the same, like they, they didn't have electricity and cars and this kind of um, the environment is different, but the philosophy and the eternal parts could still be the same in regards to painting, I think. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything more to bring to the table. Are there any, like, closing thoughts or things you want to... Um... I think... Well, I, I, I don't know if I'm starting to repeat myself, but for me... It's quite simple, simple like this. I can accept that there are people painting abstract mm. if they don't try to ruin my situation. Yeah. And that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs>